Good evening. Good evening, everybody. All right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming to People's Planning Academy 2.0, the second class. Uh, I really appreciate you all coming out on, um, on a Thursday. I'm sure you have a lot of things, uh, other things that you could be doing, but you're here. So thank you for that. Um, also, the first class was filled with information. Uh, we covered things from planning 101, who plans the city, uh, the basics of transportation planning, zoning, land use. So I know it was a lot of information, uh, but I hope you found some of the stuff uh, valuable. Um, also, after the class, um, we looked at some of the surveys that you provided, um, and we appreciate that. There's been some really good feedback that we received from you. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was the resources that are available. So I wanted to take a second and talk to you about where you can find the comprehensive plan, uh, where you can locate the zoning ordinance. Um, has anybody used the city's website? By a show of hands. Okay, so a lot of you are familiar. Have you used it recently? Okay. Uh, so for those of you who may not be as familiar uh, with the city's website, it has changed. Um, and it's, so if you have like, um, if you save links, those links no longer work. However, um, the search engine has uh, been enhanced. So like if you go to indy.gov, that's indy.gov, and type in comprehensive plan, uh, you'll be directed to this link right here. Uh, where it's telling you can find the seven ele elements of the comprehensive plans, those gears that we talked about in the first class. Uh, and you scroll down um, and you can see, for example, land use and transportation. So land use, uh, the Marion County pattern book is the first thing you see up here. And then if you wanna actually look at the map of your township, you can locate your township too. Um, so in the same, the search en engine works the same way for uh, the ordinance. Go there, it's the zoning and subdivision ordinance, uh, also known as Indy Rezone. You can click it. Um, and if you wanna look at the whole thing, um, it's right here, this first link in the text. Uh, also, but there's some other um, amendments and stuff that you can look at. So. Uh, the indy.gov website is really helpful. Um, it's not like the other one, it's a lot different, uh, but it's, it really relies on that search engine. So if you're looking, uh, looking up uh, zoning or different plans, pretty much anything you can imagine, you can type it into that uh, search engine. And then also we talked about, well, not we talked about, from reviewing your survey, you had a lot of questions about specific topics. Uh, but I would encourage you to hold on a little bit because we're going to cover a lot in uh, the future classes. So, all right. So, uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the history of Indianapolis um, transportation, past, present, and future. I'm really excited about this particular class because I have a strong appreciation for history. Uh, I think it's really important for you to know the history of your community. Uh, when you know the history, you can avoid making some mistakes um, that have been made in the past, but then also uh, learn from the successes as well. So I'm really excited. I hope you enjoyed this class. There's a lot of good um, historical information that I think will be new to a lot of you. Um, so with that being said, let's go over the agenda today. Um, so we'll begin with a timeline activity. I hope you guys haven't peeked at what's on your table yet. Um, after the timeline activity, uh, Brad will explain the current state of transportation in Indianapolis and tell us about the Indy Moves plan, which is um, the outline of the vision for our future, our city's future uh, in transportation. Then we'll wrap up the evening with Austin Gibble, who is the project manager, I'm sorry, he's the project development planner for Indigo. Uh, and he'll talk about the Marion County Transit Plan and our, our county's role in a regional transit, um, uh, transit initiative. 
So before I start, I just want to give you a few reminders. Uh, the restrooms are right outside that door. We have some uh, snacks in the back room. And if you haven't already seen, uh, to the right of the snacks, there is the Bicentennial Agenda. I can't remember someone reached out to me about having access to that. We have plenty, so feel free to grab one for yourself for you to keep. Uh, those. That's one of the few um, parts of the co comprehensive plan that we have, like physical copies. So and let me know if you want more, because we have a huge supply of <laughs> the Bicentennial Agenda. Um, yeah, so also we'll uh, have uh, feedback about this class. Um, I, in, instead of doing it uh, paper, uh, uh, via paper, we're going to do it electronically. So be on the lookout to receive an email about the survey. All right. So now, this is the part I'm really excited about. So uh, you're in groups, and you have uh, in front of you a big piece of paper and a stack of paper, which represents uh, periods in our transportation history. So each group um, has a different period in the city's transportation history. Uh, and in just a second, um, I'll ask you to lay out the events on the table and then put them in order. Uh, and uh, answer the following five questions in your group. Okay, so the first question, what is your time period? Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, what were the popular modes of transportation during that time period? How was the land used? How were people affected by transportation? And uh, what are your major takeaways about your time period? So go ahead, you, can, uh, you guys can go ahead and take a look at those, um, put them in order and everything. I'll also uh, uh, ask you guys in 15 minutes to give a report out. So once you, um, you've gone over and answered the question, make sure you identify a person to be the spokesperson for your groups. All right, you can go ahead and get started. All right, I'm glad to hear that you guys are having such a good discussion. Um, and uh, we can go ahead and get started with the report out. So I'll just jump right into it with um, group one. Can you have a, a spokesperson come up and tell us a little bit about, um, or, or if, you, if, you don't want the, if you don't want the microphone, just make sure you project so everyone can hear you. Oh, I can project, that's not a problem. <laughs> okay. In the 19th century in general, uh, really starting around the 1820s when the city of Indianapolis was actually founded, uh, going all the way up at least with our materials to the 1870s. Uh, what were our popular modes of transportation? Well, obviously, riding horseback, horse drawn wagons, by foot, uh, horse drawn trolleys where you had trolley lines, steam powered uh, locomotive trains, and later on, we would eventually have. Bicycles. So, uh, except for the train, it's very human powered for the most part. Uh, concerning how is land used, very similar to today, really. Just you know, homes, shops, factories, and streets to connect everything for the most part. Uh, just everything kind of gets jumbled together. Uh, number four, how were people affected by transportation? Well, uh, people from further away could come into the city with their skills and money if you were able to either pad a horse or able to ride the trolleys in the town or even use uh, the trains. Uh, we're talking really out of the city, perhaps out of the state, really. But you could, you could get here. And what else do we have? What are your major takeaways about your time period? Uh, low regulation of well, everything, uh, safety <laughs> They didn't really have safety labels back then. Uh, kind of similar development patterns, you know, you had businesses spring up near transit opportunities such as the horse drawn trolleys or uh, the locomotives. Zoning didn't exist for the most part. Um, and it was just kind of a free for all, anything and everything concerning uh, where you can set up shop, live. And uh, that was our major takeaways. Thank you, Group One. Um. Yeah. <laughs> group Two, can you?
you tell us a little bit about your time period? <laughs> Do I have to pick? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, guys, help me out. So, what's our time period for group two? Was is that turn of the century, so late eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, um, and our modes of transportation? Can you hear me? Bicycle, streetcar, trolley, train, rail car. Um, our land use farming. Um, the early look of suburbs appeared during this time. Um, how are people affected? Um, commuting became easier, so this was able to expand um, the neighborhoods and being able to get in and, and, and out. Um, Interurban development, we talked about that. Um, what, are, what was our major takeaways? Uh, people during this time depended heavily on public transportation, um, and the neighborhoods grew due to the, the growth of um, the um, streetcar and the rail car, um, and that was able to just expand our neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did you? Well, I'll go with. Go ahead with group three. I'll talk to you guys about this later. Group three. You probably do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So our time period was 1909 to 1953. So the first half of the century, the 20th century. Um, the popular modes of transportation were cars and uh, trolleys. First uh, trolley on the track, and then trackless trolley. Um, how the land was used, um, it shifted from, it shifted towards cars from public transportation. They started, we started to build parking lots, we had drive-in theaters, that kind of thing. Um, so people were affected by moving from public transportation to private transportation, and that led to congestion, lack of parking, um, and issues with people coming in with their own personal cars instead of using the trolleys. And then our major takeaways were that the rise of the automobile happened really quickly. Like, the, it went from like, it peaked in the 40s and then it was done by 1953. So um, cars took over real fast. Great, thank you. Uh, group four. <laughs> okay, our time period was 54 to 72. Um, popular modes were the car, trolley buses were pretty much discontinued, um, and then they had buses. The land use um, was made to accommodate the vehicle. There was pretty much a mall, the mall retail center was, boom, was a booming build, um, so it expanded. <laughs> the roads and expanded parking garages and major huge parking lots were built. Um, how were people affected? People were displaced um, from their homes to make room to build 465 and to build 70, um, I'm sorry, 65, 70 and 465. Um, and then they were, they had an easier route to get to shopping malls and then also could move to the burbs a lot quicker. There was a major migration out of Indianapolis and into Hamilton County. Their population increased by 120% in 10 years. Um, that was pretty much our major takeaway was how accessible things became and caused the migration. Because it was post-war, the big open malls and everybody could get a car and go somewhere. Thank you. Group five. Group five. Our time period was uh, the 1970s through 2015. Uh, most popular mode of transportation was primarily cars. However, buses did come, but there has been a steady decline through that period in the bus use. We did have uh, bikes and walking coming along once the Monon Trail was built, cultural trail, so those modes became uh, more prevalent toward the latter years. Uh, 
And then, uh, number three, how was land used? Well, we took the old railroads, turned those into trails. Uh, sidewalks uh, got better because we then developed the cultural trail during this time period. And the uh, good news is in 19, I mean in 2015, the land use and uh, policy guidelines were established during this period, so that helped out quite a bit. Uh, how were people affected by the transportation? Uh, busing had a big impact back in 1979, especially on the schools. Public transportation was used, it was used by uh, uh, little vouchers for kids to ride the public transportation to schools, but it still maintained a uh, car-focused uh, kind of transportation. <coughs> but what are our major takeaways? Well, bus use during the period peaked in 1984, uh, however, st steadily declined ever since. Uh, middle class to work, uh, that was pretty much done by cars to get to work, so, and there was a big move to the suburbs during this period of time. So that's what happened, big time period. Thank you. Uh, group six. Okay. Um, so we had basically today, so the late 2010s, um, a lot of the popular modes that have popped up so buses declined, a lot of the sharing has popped up, so like car shares like Blue Indy or Uber and Lyft, uh, bike shares like the Pacers bike share and scooters. Um, walking has become a little bit more popular and so is bicycling. Now we've got the red line, the new bus lanes, and then, uh, but we still have a lot of people using cars, so interstates have grown still, even though all these other modes have grown. Um, the, Land use, uh, there's a lot of more uh, mixed use. Uh, so the, was it the complete streets? Uh, we finally passed that in 2012. Yeah, and uh, so we got the complete streets. So uh, sidewalks and trails and bike lanes that are becoming more prevalent. Uh, developing some empty lots, uh, especially downtown, um, into like new apartments or mixed use developments. Um, so we've got the Blue Indy, Pacers Bike Share. Parking is more competitive. Uh, that's what we talked about with the way that people are affected is driving is a lot more stressful, parking is a lot more stressful. Um, so there's a lot of cars downtown. Uh, downtown became a pretty popular spot to go to again and so not a whole lot of space for everybody to park anymore. Um, let's see here. So, uh, and also there's just a lot of people commuting from outside of the actual city. Uh, all the suburbs that have grown and continue to grow. Uh, and the main takeaway is we have a lot of options. Um, a lot of the options are kind of exclusionary uh, to people that can't really afford to just do whatever. Um, the, bu the bus lanes, the Indigo has not, is not exactly all encompassing. And so it's making it hard for some of the poor people to get around as easily as other people do. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, group two, one of the uh, uh, parts of your time period that got me really excited was the um, prevalence of the bicycle. I don't know if you guys got to that, but um, bicycles really took over Indianapolis during that time period. It got so bad that the mayor, um, uh, he put a fee in place for you to have a bicycle license. So just to give you an idea. and then. Yeah, a dollar, yeah, a dollar fee, and then on um, 30th and Central, there was a, a bicycle track called the Newbie Oval, and it was um, large enough to accommodate over 20,000 people. So, for racing. Yeah, for race, races. Yeah, yeah, for, I'm sorry, that's an important point, bike races. <laughs> Not just like people just hanging out, but yeah, bike races. So that was one of the time periods uh, that I was really excited about. Of, um, that I wouldn't have imagined. Um, so thank you all for your valuable insights. Um, you can't hear me. Oh, sorry. You can't hear me because it's not on. Okay. Okay, it wasn't on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your valuable insights. Um, I wanted this op this activity to be a little bit more than like how transportation has changed. I mean, it has been like a huge transformation since um, our city was established in the um, 18, 
uh, the 1800s to now. However, what I was really hoping um, is that you guys were able to connect that relationship between the land use and transportation and how that affected um, and how they're linked. So just uh, transportation affects land use and then also land use affects transportation. Uh, and they influence uh, so many aspects of our lives. Uh, where we live, our economy, uh, they influence our recreation, uh, as we learned with the Newbie Oval and then um, drive-in businesses. Um, they influence policy, like I mentioned with the bicycle craze, and then um, the scooter regulations, which were established just this year. Um, as we think about transportation and land use, I think it's also important, um, it's also essential to think about how people are affected. Um, who benefits from transportation? Um, who, um, I'm sorry, how people benefit from transportation and then also how it's harmful, and then thinking about who it benefits and um, who is harmed by different uh, transportation and land uses. Um, so before we moved on, I wanted to show you guys that, because um, uh, only a few groups had an opportunity to look at this, um, but this is a depiction of the streetcar lines in 1916. So I don't know if you can see it from the back, but it was pretty extensive, right? Um, and then the next one, sorry. Sorry trying to get my order together. And the next one is the interurban electric railways. So these are all electric railways in our, in our county, in our city. 1916. Um, and then uh, to kind of give you a visual of the relationship between transportation and land use over time, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Erica Henshaw, who's our GIS coordinator, she created an animation to show the relationship between the development of roadways and um, neighborhoods. today. <laughs> so for me, that was kind of powerful to see that relationship uh, illustrated in that way. Um, so now that we have an idea of what uh, our history looked like through trans um, in regards to transportation and land use, I'll go ahead and um, hand it over to Brad to talk to us a little bit about the current state of transportation and then also the future. Um, just so you all know, everybody will have access to um, the timeline slides. We sent you an email um, yesterday, so you should have them in your email box, but so everybody can, can look through them. All right, thank you, Brittany. So we were joking in the office that, you know, why is Indianapolis located where we are? Anyone know? White River. So we thought White River was navigable. We turns out it wasn't, so we turned our back on it. Um, we kind of come full circle. We've been joking in the office because where do our scooters end up now? <laughs> back up, out in the White River, right? <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to talk uh, briefly about kind of the current state of transportation in our city, and then I really want to focus on Indy Moves, which is our city's first ever long-range transportation plan. Um, and so as we started um, the Indy Moves process, we started looking at 16 kind of existing plans that we had um, that looked at greenways and bikeways and freight and all sorts of different modes of transportation. Um, and then we really summed up kind of the values that we saw 
um, in each of those. And so, or that, that was kind of permeated all of them. And so there's a lot of focus on economic development, its relations to transportation, um, safety and impact on the environment, um, fixing it first before building new, so improving our existing assets, um, thinking about the region, because our roads don't stop at the county border, um, and then also about how we connect things, provide choices for our residents um, to move around. And so those are some kind of values that we heard and we saw in existing plans and they were kind of reinforced as we went out and talked to um, the community. And so um, I'm gonna cover some pieces of our existing conditions report. Um, it's really the, the state of transportation as uh, we find it today. And so as you likely know, Indianapolis is a huge city. Um, if you don't, um, Austin will give you a slide um, here in a bit that talks a little bit about that. Um, but we've got everything in our city. We've got a dense downtown with 52-story skyscrapers. Uh, we've got traditional neighborhoods. We've got suburban areas. And we have active farms with combines, all within um, Indianapolis. And so our roadway, our transportation network, really has to serve um, all of those competing needs um, and value systems. And so uh, Indy Moves really is our uh, latest attempt, anyway, of trying to reconcile all the needs of our community to provide the most choices for the most people. Um, this is um, a sobering map, but this is a map um, of crashes, um, of pedestrian crashes um, in Marion County um, between 2012 um, and 2016, so, so four, four years. And so the darker the color, the more accidents happen. So you can clearly see um, our major roads. What do planners call major roads? Arterials, good, that's on the test. Um, and so you can clearly see that we've got lots of arterial roads that have lots of pedestrian um, crashes. Some of that is because that's, there's a lot of traffic and a lot of pedestrians on them. Um, but some of that, especially in the outer townships, is because we don't have pedestrian facilities on them. And so we have people walking in the ditch or on the shoulder of the road, um, things like that. Now, the biggest contribution to pedestrian injury and fatalities um, is the speed of the car. Um, and so that's something that we really uh, focus in on. Now, driving continues to be um, the way that most of our city gets around, um, but so, so that's kind of what a lot of us think about when we think about transportation, but just by numbers, some other aspects of transportation um, in our city. And so uh, right now, 54% of our city live kind of within a walking distance, walking distance of an Indigo bus line. So that means half do and about half don't. Um, Austin's gonna talk about how we're looking to change some of those numbers. Um, only about a third of our streets have sidewalks on at least one side. So that's a massive deficit for us. Um, a lot of that is when you tie together, you know, group three story about um, the automobile exploding kind of overnight, um, and also looking at the, that map of development over time, a lot of our city was built at a time when that was happening, um, when pedestrians uh, facilities were actually not valued um, by our community. And there was actually a time in our city when we had executive orders asking us not to build sidewalks. Um, so how, how, how times change, right, and how values change. Uh, we've got um, over 100 miles of bike lanes, 8,000 miles of streets that DPW has to maintain and plow and do all that stuff. Um, among that, we've got four, 540 bridges that DPW has to maintain, which are very expensive. Uh, 14,000 tons of freight come through our airport. Our airport is actually busier at night than it is during the day. It's one of the few airports where that happens, and that's because of the FedEx um, major hub. Uh, about 800 miles of Indigo service. Um, Blue Indy has been, um, has had about 1.5 million miles traveled on it. And so there are some people that use that. We have 200, you know, almost 300 miles of railroad and about 100 miles of trails and greenways with lots more planned. And so we've got lots of types um, of transportation modes um, in our city. Um, but when it comes to driving to work, um, still a vast majority of people drive alone um, to work. And so 85% drive alone. Um, another 10% carpool, and so that's up to 95% of our people using a car um, to get around. And so that's, uh, that's why you see us spending a lot of money on our roadways. Now this compares to some other cities, and so you can see it's not simply just because we're a city that we have to share. You look at Minneapolis, which is a similar um, city in character anyway to ours, and they're 20% less driving alone. And so they've obviously done something different um, to provide uh, different options for their residents. And so here's our other mode split. So 2% bus, 2% uh, walking, and 1% um, biking. <clears throat> now, when you start compare how well our 
driving service is compared to our bus service, you start to pick up some disparities. And so um, you can see that uh, by, you know, among all of these peer cities listed, we have the longest bus rides, um, the longest commute. Um, our car commute's about average. But when you look at kind of the difference between the two, the disparity pops out. And so again, Minneapolis, the difference between taking a bus and driving a car is only 14 minutes. Um, here, it's, it's 23. And so we've got um, some work to do. And again, Austin will talk more about how we're trying to approach that. Now, again, we're a 400 square mile city. Um, things are changing differently in different places. And so um, I, I wish I had, um, sage advice about uh, what to, to explain this map, but on this map is the change in people who drive alone to work between 2006 and 2011. Um, the, dark, the blue and the darker blue are places where people are driving a lot less, and the orange and the red are places where they're driving um, a lot more. Um, and so again, I can't uh, you know, explain any patterns. It's, it's interesting that you see red in downtown, and so in the heart of our city where we have the most transportation options, people are driving more. Um, and that's likely because we have a lot of reverse commuting starting to happen where people want to live downtown, but they still work um, up in Hamilton County, up Meridian Street, something like that. So that's just an, in, that's one observation. Um, so the regional story, um, how are those people driving? And so about half, more than half of the people <coughs> that drive in or that drive are driving on our county roads. So DPW owned and maintained roads. About 40% use the interstates. Um, and here's the inflow of kind of inflow and out, outflow of driving habits in our region. So the the light blue are the commuters coming into our county um, every day. The dark blue are you know Marion County residents going outside the county. Um, and you can see there's a lot of people um, taking a lot of jobs in Marion County that come from someplace else, and that matters because we don't receive any tax revenue. Um, from them. We don't get the property tax revenue, we don't get their income tax revenue, um, but we still have to provide police service, fire service, plow, maintain, fill those potholes, repave those streets. Um, and so that um, is a critical uh, regional issue for us that we have struggled with uh, for some time. Um, when it comes to freight, so freight is a huge piece of our regional economy that's kind of not always visible. You see all the warehouses and semi trucks and things out by the airport. Do um, you guys know what they're actually moving? Um, and so by value, or by weight, we move a lot of gravel. So there's a lot of gravel pits you know, along the White River, um, along both in Marion and Hamilton County. So we move about 18 million tons of gravel um, every year. But when it comes to value, we ship a lot of drugs, pharmaceuticals, <laughs> legal drugs. Illegal drugs are not measured in here. <laughs> and so, so in those trucks, we're moving a lot of gravel and a lot of Prozac, right? <laughs> so just interesting um, to understand what's happening um, in our um, freight. So there's, again, most of our freight is moving by truck. We don't have a lot of rail um, movement. Now, how does that impact kind of the affordability, how our city grows? Um, when you've looked, when we shared that timeline of development patterns, you could see just our cities, you know, sprawl out, jump out like crazy as we built more and more roads. Um, and so, one challenge for that is providing transportation, especially transportation options that serve that entire, that very large geography. Um, and so, Indianapolis, you know, we always say we're pretty affordable, right? Um, you look at New York and San Francisco and the coast or Denver, and like we've got some great housing prices. But when you factor in our transportation prices, we're actually not that affordable at all. We're kind of in the middle of the pack of the region. So, um, you know, this in dark blue here, um, or light blue, is their housing cost, so the percent of a person's income that gets spent in housing. And the dark, or the, the darker blue, um, is the transportation costs. And so you can see in Indianapolis, we actually spend more on transportation than we do on housing. And so who do you think that costs, that burden, who's burdened by that cost the most? What population group? It's the lower income folks. They're the ones that are spending a greater and greater share of their income moving around our city because they can't get to the bus or the bus doesn't run uh, when they need to get to work or they're driving to Plainfield or across the county lines where the bus doesn't go. 
Um, and so that became a key piece of the Marion County Transit Plan, again, that Austin will get to. Um, and so this uh, is this is where all that's happening. And so the, the darker yellows where the darker residential, or the darker yellows where the red, you know, denser residential populations are, the darker blue is where the denser employment um, areas are, and that teal color is kind of where they overlap. So how do we, you know, transportation is not a goal. Transportation is a means to achieve a goal, right? Uh, we don't just drive around for the fun of it. Some people do, it stresses me out. But, but generally we drive around to achieve something. We drive to work to make a livelihood for our families. We drive across town to visit our friends or something like that. Um, one of the biggest reasons we are looking at transportation, again, relates to that cost, is how do we use transportation to increase ac access to opportunity. And so um, when you look at different income threads in our community, um, this is how we've performed um, between 2006 and 2016. So kind of pre-recession and post-recession. The only band of income that's actually better off is the top 3%. And we think transportation has a large role um, in that story. Um, and so we've worked on this transportation equity index to understand where people are likely to need more choices based on their demographic variables. And so where do people not have cars? Uh, where are people, have, where do we have a lot of kids, a lot of elderly? Um, where do we have uh, neighborhoods of color? Where do we have um, pockets of poverty, things like that? And so we add all kinds of different, more than a dozen variables together, and we kind of get this map. And so the darker the green is the greater need for something besides um, roads to handle cars. So this is starting to influence where we start investing in these different transportation um, options. Um, and then finally, um, you drive on our roads, or you ride on your roads, or you walk on our sidewalks, it's no um, secret to you that we have funding challenges. And um, uh, we, you know, we've had no secret about that. Um, a lot of that has to do with all those commuters coming in that we don't receive tax revenue. Um, but essentially, we have 160 to 180 million dollars a year um, deficit in our transportation funding. Um, this is where the money comes from. This is after the, the, the tax, in, the state sales, or the gas tax increase that happened last year. So we get about $74 million a year that, that come in to help um, ma maintain our transportation system. Um, and again, we need about 100, you know, a little over 100 million more than that. So um, huge challenges we have, and so we know that we have to make strategic choices in how to invest um, those resources. And so that's where we start talking about um, indie moves. Um, and so we talked last time about the thoroughfare plan, incredibly exciting conversation about arterials and collectors and local roads and things like that. And as you remember, it's that yellow gear um, up there. Um, the master gear there is Indy Moves, and so that is our city's long-range transportation plan. Uh, we just completed it last year. Um, it's the first time we've ever had such a plan um, in, in our city's history. It brings together lots of different transportation goals um, and systems. The only system it really doesn't in integrate is the Marion County Transit Plan, but it does respond to that, and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> and so we went out to um, the community. Hopefully some of you were able to participate in some of our open houses, our sessions with counselors, or online surveys. Um, but th these are really the things that we heard, and so people want more options. Safety is important. It's not just about speed. Uh, we need to fix what we have. Um, for transit, uh, more frequent service and kind of walkability to get to the service is more is important. Um, when you're driving, obviously potholes matter. Um, and if you're biking, um, a preference for separated facilities rather than on-street kind of painted bike lanes. Um, and so what we did is we translated all those into these goals. And so we do have um, seven goals. Um, in the past, transportation policy was really driven by one or two goals. Anyone know what? Used to drive transportation policy? Bikes. Cars, money, issues. What, what two issues drove? So speed. Parking, Parking actually. Convenience. Yeah, so um, speed and um, congestion. Where we had cars congested, we invested, we, ri we widened roads, we did things like that to, to reduce the congestion. The goal was to keep moving people as fast as they can. Um, and so we're shifting away from that goal. Um, we have goals related to health and safety, the um, environment, um, economic development, equity, going back to the equity index, um, providing choices for people, 
um, building those regional connections so people can get around, um, and then being more strategic about where we invest, knowing that we've got limited resources, we can't do everything, we have to be very particular about where we invest. And so that's um, what Indie Moves um, discusses. And so these are, when you talk about how um, we select projects, we started um, gathering projects from existing plans, and so Greenway's master plan that um, Indy Parks works on, um, a freight plan that connects us to so the trade association for the trucking industry, um, everything in between. We really like, what is the, what are people demanding, whatever perspective, what are they demanding from our transportation system? And so we put that out through a public comment system. We allowed people to suggest um, new projects. We grouped them into corridors, recognizing that um, a bus project and a, a road improvement project and a sidewalk project, they all need to happen together um, to be efficient. Um, and then we put them through an evaluation process, which I'll get to here in a second, and that resulted into what is our city's long-range capital plan um, for transportation. And so this is kind of an example of when we threw up all the maps from all these different plans, kind of what our transportation system looked like. Um, one of the key things that we are in the process of doing, and this is um, steps, um, is removing a lot of our expansion plans. Um, and so on the map here, it might be a little hard to see, but the things that are in pinkish red um, are previous roads that we had planned to widen. So usually from two to four lanes, sometimes from four to six lanes. Um, those have been taken off of our plans. We no longer um, see the need to widen them because of the, tr the driving habits that we're seeing, the traffic volumes, but we also can't afford it. So there are still places in our community that are growing, and there are, also, there are, st are still um, residents um, and values that demand that. And so we do have it, but the important thing to know is we've reduced our expansion plans by 60%. Um, and so that's, that's our first step, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, we also use this, um, this opportunity to update our bicycle network. And so this is our um, long-term bicycle network. Again, you'll have the slides or you'll get the slides if you don't have them already so you can see this map um, more closely. Um, our Future bike network is a mix of the very expensive protected system, and so that's the trail off to the side of the road or the, you know, the protected um, lanes. Um, but it's also a thing called neighborways, and you may have heard some news about some of our, you know, initial work on neighborways. But that's recognizing that some streets are quiet enough that you can walk on them, you can bike on them safely. Um, and so for people that are intimidated, so you know. Average, you know, families, average users that are intimidated in riding some, on some of our bike lanes, we want to make sure that we have an alternative um, pathway that they can move around our, net, our, our city. And so we call those neighbor ways. They're essentially streets that we want to keep quiet. And so we want to keep them low volume, low speed, so that might involve traffic calming devices that might involve more four-way stops, things like that. And so we do have the hardcore expensive infrastructure, a system of that, but we augment that with kind of this um, quiet, calmed um, neighborway system. So the Indy Moves Capital Projects have lots of pieces from um, transit improvements to bike lanes to um, improving our traffic signals, which are woefully inadequate, um, and everything in between. Um, altogether, we have, I think, about 406 different projects. And so these are how they um, pan out. And so I mentioned we group them into corridors. And so a complete street is where we have um, we, we have planned widening, um, but that again would be a complete street. So that would be a roadway widening, but also has bike and pedestrian facilities that go with it. Um, complete street upgrades, you see there's 123 of those. That's taking an existing street and adding both bike and ped facilities to them. Uh, we do have uh, 59 projects um, with greenways um, that come largely from the greenways uh, master plan. So there's more than 200 miles of additional greenways planned. Um, and then we have you know, 200 um, bike or ped um, projects as well. And so we've shifted a lot of our plans from roadway expansion into more of the bike ped um, multimodal facilities. And so this is what that looks like on the map. Um, it's kind of hard to decipher, but the, the red is, are the, red and blue are kind of the street projects. Um, the green and the orange are more of the active recreation. We also have um, railroad relocation from downtown on city policy for the first time um, ever. So there's a lot of projects we don't have a lot of money, so how do we choose which ones to go? And so what we did is we um, took our goals that we heard from the community and attached metrics to them. 
um, with the idea that if a project meets more of these goals, it should probably happen faster um, than some other projects. And so you can see um, the different kind of ratings. And so safety um, and environmental sustainability really rank um, the highest in our system. Um, and then when you um, skip that, when you map them out, um, each of those projects that we just showed you, um, this is what it looks like. And so the, the greener the project, the higher the priority um, in our system, um, the projects that are red and orange rank lower. Now, does that mean that the projects in green will hap happen sooner than the projects in red? Perhaps. Um, but it's also important to know that each of these projects has a different funding pot. So some funding pots move faster um, than others, and there's also opportunities that might come up in places where we have a m massive economic development project or something like that that might make one of those lower priorities make sense to do now. And so this is a, a framework for making decisions. It's not the decision, um, but it helps us, again, making sure that our limited investments that we have actually have the greatest impact um, on our community. Um, and so when you pull out the, the highest priority projects, um, this is what the map um, looks like. And so there's five um, street expansion projects. There's 17 complete street upgrades, and so that's adding the bike ped facilities. And there's eight greenways. There's 15 bike or um, ped additions. And then the freight railroad relocation actually pops up quite high um, in here as well. There's also programmatic recommendations, since so Vision Zero um, is the idea. I think we I mentioned last time, but the idea that the paramount um, purpose of our transportation system is that no one dies on it. Um, and so that, um, that might seem obvious, but for a long time, again, congestion and speed were our major goals, safety kind of fell to the side. And so now we're suggesting we need to much, move much more to the safety perspective. People still need to get where they need to go, um, but it's more importantly that they do it safely than they get there five minutes faster. And so that's kind of where we're going. Um, and we've also done a lot of work internally in city county government um, we used to have a Department of Transportation, an entire department um, that talked about, talked about transportation. Um, we don't anymore. We have lots of different players in it. And so the Department of Public Works in large part builds and operates it. Um, DMD largely plans it. But we have business and neighborhood services that do a lot of right-of-way permitting and things like that. Uh, we have Indigo that operates the bus system. And we have Indy Parks. Um, that has a role, especially with the Greenway system. And so we've talked a lot internally about how we put this together. I'm incredibly excited that we are going to start next year. We'll have the start of, the, of a, a new transportation planning section um, that sits between Public Works and Metro Development for the first time since the 19, um, 1980s. Um, so that's, that's Andy Moves. And so that's what our current long range transportation plan says. Um, what time is it? Uh, 708. All right, so um, I want to make sure we hear from Austin. And so we will have time for questions from all of us um, at the end. And so I'd like to introduce um, Austin Gibble to talk about the uh, Marion County Transit Plan. Uh, as Brad mentioned, my name is Austin Gibble. I am a project development planner with the Indianapolis Public Transportation uh, uh, Corporation, otherwise known as Indigo. Uh, and my title is entirely main, made up and means nothing and everything. I do everything from project management to spatial data analysis. So. Bear with me. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to kind of cover uh, that Brad mentioned was what Indianapolis currently looks like and some of the challenges that we face. Uh, he mentioned that we have a, a lot of land use challenges. The big takeaway is that we are geographically quite large. We are 400 square miles. Um, to put that into perspective, that is just shy of the land area of the city of Los Angeles with one third the population. We are enormous with a very low population density. Uh, we, historically, we've significantly under, underspent on transit, especially within the last 30 years or so. Uh, our service levels were actually double what they were in the early 1990s than they, are, uh, than they were in 2016. Um, this number has shifted a little bit, but we in 2016 we spent uh, we were 86th in spending per capita on public transportation, uh, even though we are one of the most expensive housing plus transportation markets in the country. So the Marion County Transit Plan uh, came about a few years ago. Uh, it started out as the Central Indiana Task Force uh, in about 2009. 
Uh, there was a very heavy focus on a single rail line running from downtown Indianapolis to the northeast uh, into Fishers and Noblesville on the former Nickel Plate Railroad corridor. Um, it became fairly apparent uh, in the following years that this was not going to be viable, either politically or financially. Uh, and as Mayor Ballard said, uh, I can sell a system, I can't sell a line. Uh, so we started looking at transit in a manner that was more holistic. We started looking at what is the local bus network needs? Where are the corridors? Uh, where do the corridors exist that are going to have the greatest impact uh, not just to the residents who live along them or to accessibility, but also to economic development. So all of these kind of came into what became the Marion County Transit Plan, and that was put on the ballot in 2016. The Marion County Transit Plan process uh, and what was also known as the Indy Connect process earlier on uh, was the most extensive public outreach process uh, that the city of Indianapolis has ever done with literally hundreds of public meetings over the course of a few years. Uh, it also required legislative action. So as some of you know, Indiana is a Dillon's rule state. This means that we cannot enact new taxes uh, without the approval of the state legislature. We went to the state legislature three times, three times before they said that we would uh, be allowed to hold a transit referendum on the ballot uh, with them holding several stipulations, uh, one of them being that we could not build light rail with any of the tax dollars that were raised um, and that you could only do it, uh, I believe it was two times within a seven year period. But we passed on the first try with a 60% uh, margin yes vote, um, which is virtually unheard of, especially with an in income tax. Um, and it was really a, a, a broad coalition of individuals and uh, organizations who led the process. Uh, it was really spearheaded by the Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, in the upper levels and the mayor's office, uh, as well as faith-based organizations, nonprofits, community groups, and numerous public volunteers. Public volunteers have been at the forefront of this effort since the beginning. Uh, everything from the Marion County Transit Plan and the Transit Talks efforts to uh, what we call um, transit, thank you, sorry, V's like staring at me. You know what they're called, the transit ambassadors uh, that we have today. This was a massive campaign leading up to the vote and it required public input and support through every step. And this tax was passed and it was ratified by the city county council in early 2017 and then Indigo started collecting those dollars in October of 2017. So what does, does this 0.25% income tax fund? Uh, it will, by the time the Marion County Transit Plan is built out, uh, had increased revenue service hours on the system by 70%. This is longer service hours, shorter wait times, running earlier in the morning, later at night. Uh, numerous capital improvements. Um, so these are new bus stops, uh, improving ADA compliance, connecting to sidewalks, as well as the bus rapid transit lines. Currently, uh, we launched the Red Line BRT. Yay! <laughs> so that's the first of our three BRT lines. And next year, um, while it's not big and shiny like our, our BRT projects that get a lot of attention, uh, the new frequent grid will have just as, if not more, impact than the bus rapid transit lines. So the frequent grid will change our system from a system that runs, has bus rapid, or excuse me, not bus rapid transit lines, regular bus lines running from every 30 to 60 minutes and coming in and out of downtown to a system where bus lines crisscross one another and almost half of the bus lines will run every 15 minutes or better. Uh, initially, we'll, uh, or excuse, additionally we'll, we will be uh, launching the MyKey fare collection system. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of this. If you haven't, it is the new fare collection system that will be rolling out to Indigo uh, this November. And it is an account-based system. So. You might be familiar with paying cash or get it, buying the paper tickets, but something that we notice as we continue to evaluate our system and our fare payment system and our fare collection methods um, was that a lot of our riders are unbanked. I think it's roughly 30% of our riders do not have access to a bank account or a debit card, and they don't have the time or resources to come all the way downtown and drop $60 on a monthly pass uh, in, in cash. 
So what this resulted in was individuals paying $4 a day for a day pass. Over the course of a month, that's more than double the cost of a monthly pass. That is not fair, that is not equitable. So we are introducing uh, an account-based system with fair capping in which individuals will not pay more than $4 in a day or $15.75 in a week, which equates to the cost of a monthly pass. So no more of the uh, paying double, it's expensive to be poor situations. Um, <laughs> Uh, some, other uh, some other projects that we are doing, uh, Super Stops, that's my baby, I'm the project manager for that. Um, that is a bus priority project uh, for downtown Indianapolis on Delaware Street, Alabama Street, and Fort Wayne Avenue. That includes, uh, might include a bus lane on Delaware Street, uh, 90 foot long platforms that can accommodate more than one bus at a time, shelters, real time information, ticket vending machines. And then we are also looking into what's called the, uh, the personal mobility network and we're working with key stakeholders on that. And that would um, integrate uh, multiple modes of transportation from an interfacing standpoint into a single account, into the MyKey system. So that would take, allow individuals to access car share, bike share, transit, all on a single card with a single account and really widen the, pers the, the, the available transportation options across the entire city. So this is uh, how our network looks uh, as of about a month ago, on the left, uh, you can see the red line running north and south, but you see a lot of green, those are lines that run once an hour, and a lot of blue, those are lines that run once every 30 minutes, and the orange, you see some orange, but those are lines that run every 15 minutes. Uh, in the map on the right, uh, you see the red line running north, south, and black, sorry for the uh, disparities in colors here. Uh, but the red lines run every 15 minutes and the blue lines run every 30 minutes. You see a lot more red crisscrossing throughout the entire city, a lot of blue, uh, and a lot less green. So uh, more frequency, uh, better hours. Uh, and then finally, in 2025, we will have built out the entire system with three bus rapid transit lines. And the next two bus rapid transit lines are the purple line. Uh, that is the second BRT line with construction expected to begin in 2021 and open for service in late 2022 or early 2023. Uh, it's just shy of 15 miles long and will run from downtown Indianapolis to Lawrence uh, at the Ivy Tech campus there, not far from Fort Harrison State Park. And the third and final line will be the blue line. Uh, it will be essentially a county line to county line service running from Cumberland all the way out to the Indi Indianapolis International Airport. It'll be 24 miles long, little fun fact, uh, when it's completed it will be the longest single BRT line in North America. Uh, and it is anticipated for construction in 2022-2023 about when the red line, or excuse me, the purple line opens and open for service in late 2024 or early 2025. But fixed guideway transportation is really, really important to land use, which has been a, an umbrella discussion that we've had through, throughout the night. Uh, and throughout the majority of Indianapolis's history, our neighborhoods and the places that we love, like Fountain Square and Broad Ripple, uh, have been shaped by fixed guideway transportation. Um, and they have the ability to, even today, continue to foster uh, more places that we love and really boost places who, that need that kind of that help. Um, and it's, additionally, it's critical to reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled, it's critical to improving walkability, accessibility, but it can only happen if it is enabled by policy. And currently our, our existing zoning codes make it very, very easy to build auto-oriented uses and very difficult to build transit-oriented uses, uh, and that is something that is being actively worked on. So, with that, Brad? Or Brittany? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Austin, and thank you, Brad, for uh, providing more of the context of what's happening now. Um, I want to uh, allow us a few minutes to um, answer any questions that you have about what we covered today. I know you have questions. How is the state legislature against us raising taxes for transportation purposes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Austin answer that. <laughs> so. 
fun question to, ooh, sorry, fun question to answer. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of like the nicest way possible. Do we have any state house representatives? <laughs> The, the question was, uh, why was the uh, state legislature so hesitate, uh, so hesitative to grant Indianapolis the ability to raise taxes for transit? Um, and the reality is that Indiana is a rural domi rurally dominated state. We have a rurally dominated legislature uh, who have uh, an interest in keeping taxes low and not so much experience in understanding the way that transit can impact a city. Uh, or a neighborhood or a community. Um, and it took some time to really kind of get that message across. Um, so, and that was definitely one of the major challenges that we had was how do you convince a state legislature that has historically not had that kind of exposure to say let us, to, uh, to, to let us do this. Uh, There's another answer. <laughs> well, when the, uh, when the uh, General Assembly approved the construction of canals and paid for that with tax dollars and bankrupted the state, so that kind of left a sour taste in their mouth about funding public transit. That is one yes. Of the yes, that wound is still sore 200 years later. It's still <laughs> Tom, Tom, that the uh, bankruptcy also happened in uh, 1837, which was a national uh, panic, economic panic. The cities across the country were hurt because of the panic in 37. What was the objection to light rail? I never understood that. <laughs> Part of it kind of goes back to, um, I'm, I'm sorry, what's your name in the back? Tom? Tom. Tom. What Tom mentioned where there was a hesitation to put something physically in the ground where if it fails and it's a bus-based system, then it's easier to dismantle. That was the general line of thinking behind it. But I will say, so you know, all of us planners lament that we couldn't do light rail, and that became an issue with when we landed the finalists for Amazon, right? Um, I think it was actually a blessing in disguise that they prohibited us, because we can build our entire system for what we would have spent on a single line of light rail. And so it may not be as you know sexy, um, but we provide you know ninety percent of the amenities and you know experience of light rail um, with a fraction of the cost. And when you're trying to serve a giant city like ours, um, I think and there's and uh, there's nothing prohibiting us in the future if things change, demand warrants it, from replacing those red that red paint with, with tracks, right? And so don't it's I don't think it's a, a a bad as an issue as some of us thought initially. All right, other questions? Do you have a question in the back? Yeah, I was going to say, for the places where the BRT lines go out, like the Lawrence and the expansion of the red line up into Hamilton County, will there be like park and ride options for people to be able to park and hop on the buses into town? So the question was, um, for the expansion projects for the BRT, will there be uh, park and ride options? So if you're not familiar with park and ride, it's literally what it sounds like. You drive to a parking location to get on the bus. So I have a very long answer to what seems like a very simple question. <laughs> Um, the first is that Hamilton County, by state law, has to hold their own referendum for transit. So as of right now, the only expansions for the red line are to send the BRT infrastructure to the county lines around 2025, um, but not into Hamilton County at this time. The other is that Indigo does not plan on spending capital dollars to build parking facilities. Uh, we are planning for the blue line to kind of resurface some existing parking lots uh, near 460, each end of the line at 465. Um, but the, the reality is that land around transit is valuable. And we value people living close to transit and more people living close to transit than people driving to transit. So that's kind of a sort of but no answer. <laughs> earlier in the conversation tonight, 
you talked about commuter tax and not being able to afford. And I'm thinking, well, if you want less cars on the roads, tearing the roads up, provide an alternative because the commuting is not going to stop. I actually, as a city of Indianapolis official, I actually don't mind people from Hamilton County sitting in traffic and driving in potholes. <laughs> 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 um, so if that makes them want to move into Marion County <laughs> um, and live in our amazing neighborhoods and ride our amazing um, public transit service. Um, yeah. All right, a couple more questions. <laughs> so that was on tape, too. <laughs> um, so I live in, grew up in Perry Township, and right now there are three lines that only go north-south, and uh, the only one that will, for your plan for expansion and frequent plan, are still all three of those lines, except for the 90, which connects to the red line, are still on the once every 60 minutes. So I don't know if, we, there's a lot of poor people in Perry Township. Um, and so I was wondering if there are any plans for more frequency in Perry Township and also any east-west lines, because yeah, there's not a whole lot of connection down there. So there aren't any immediate plans for higher frequency at this time in Perry Township. The challenge with Perry Township is that outside of the Madison corridor, it's very, very low density. A lot of single family homes, a lot of places missing sidewalks, a lot of places with cul-de-sacs. It's just not an area that is conducive to transit use. Um, <laughs> that's what, that, she's saying that I've been thinking if we could have a park and ride, which actually yeah. I think there, it does one, one does exist at Green Park Mall. Yeah, and that one will stay. I, I'm sorry, I failed to mention that. But yes, that one does will like, continue to exist. Okay. So there's opportunities to do park and ride without building new infrastructure to do it. You can right. either lease or whatever or partner. Yeah, and, and we're looking at other partnerships as well with existing uh, resources. So what's the uh, last mile strategy about? The last miles? The last mile strategy? As far as transit, yeah, from the, from the door to the next. Uh, isn't that what scooters was supposed to do? Well, scooters are a private company. We don't have anything to do with that. Can you explain what last mile is? The question was, what's the first mile, last mile strategy for transit? And that's a conversation that we are continuously having at Indigo, especially within our strategic planning department, is what's the next step? How do we move Indigo from just being a transit provider to a mobility provider? Um, and so the personal mobility network is a part of that, where you, know, you have a seamless connection to bike share, to blue Indy car share. Um, but we're also looking at other partnerships and ways that we can do physical co-location of, uh, of shared mobility services as well. So right now it's still very, very early and very high level, but that's a conversation that is ongoing. And I'll also say a lot of that falls on the city, right? So Indigo operates the transit. We have to get people to the transit lines. Um, and so Indy moves, one of those criteria, one of those factors, there's several factors related to proximity to, to trans the transit, especially the rapid transit routes. Um, and so that is prioritized now in our funding formula. Um, a lot of our funding for our roads and things, uh, uh, we have federal match for those, and those are um, six, eight year horizons before we, where we have to apply. Um, and so we do have some incoming grants coming in the next um, years, um, Safe Routes to Transit, that help improve kind of the, the feeder sidewalks um, into our rapid transit routes, especially the red line. Um, and so we are working and playing catch up, um, but that does factor in. We recognize that if people can't safely walk to the red line, it's really not of much value to them. And so that really falls on us. Um, Indigo has been fantastic in rebuilding our infrastructure. Um, a good chunk, 30% of the red, 40 percent of the red line funding was fixing city infrastructure. And so pavement, sidewalk panels, um, curb and drainage, things like that. Um, and so we have a, in the purple line and the blue line, there's even more work to be done. So there is a lot of um, money that we're all trying to steer towards that last mile connection. Um, the personal mobility network, the idea that you're in the same account can work on you know, any mode of transportation that you choose, I think that's incredibly promising. Um, and we've started playing with scooters. And so, uh, you know, we've, you know, that's a, we're, we're all still trying to figure out scooters and figure out where they all, why they all end up in the river. But, um, 
Now we're trying to figure out like how are those a solution? Do those work in neighborhoods? And so we've, you know, in our latest scooter policy update, we have access zones now where we actually require um, all of our scooter operators to place a percentage of their scooters um, in neighborhoods. And part of the definition of where those neighborhoods were um, was related to our transportation equity index that I shared earlier, um, but it's also proximity to, to BRT. Um, so it's an experiment. Will those work? You know, those require these and those require um, credit cards. And so the unbanked people, it may not be an option for, um, but we're starting to experiment with things like that to see if we can address some of that, that first mile, last mile stuff. So the question is about the freight rail relocation. And so that's actually, so the freight railroad are the CSX tracks that um, go um, by Lucas Oil Stadium, by Bankers Life Fieldhouse. Um, if you live on the east side, you can check into the, the, uh, the dang train, right? Uh, because it's always, it's always in the way. Um, so that, it's that section of freight that we're looking at, and we've been looking for decades. This is nothing new. Um, we've actually had a couple studies done about costs to do that. Um, this is the first time it's shown up in adopted official policy that it is something we would desire to do. Um, the good thing about Indianapolis is we have a belt railroad line that goes along the south side um, of, of town. It's mostly grade separated. Um, and so the idea is we would um, move the mainline tracks, we double track upgrade that belt line, completely grade separate it so the train would never honk through our neighborhoods. Um, it would never block ambulances or me trying to get to the city county building. Um, <laughs> So that is, that's long term, that's a massively expensive project. Is that the city's responsibility? Um, uh, is it the city's responsibility? Or, or I mean, because If we want that to move, it is our responsibility. Okay. Um, <laughs> so railroads are almost, they almost function as federal entities. Um, our right of way does not cross their right of way. Um, they, um, they come, yeah, so our right-of-way stops at the railroad tracks. Um, so it's, it's that much preemption that the railroads have over us. And so if we desire, you know, for all of our values, if we desire to have them moved, um, we, will, we can work with CSX. Um, and I will say that we've started to have conversations with CSX and they're aware of all of our frustrations, um, but they're also operating a business. And so we are um, exploring, you know, doing some additional studies about what it would actually take um, to do that, and then part of that is how do we actually fund that? So, you can pick. And we're available after. I just want to respect everybody's time. We're running a couple minutes over, so I'll take one more question and then uh, just chat with us after. Um, yeah, this is kind of a question to Indy's past, and just just biking around, being around Indianapolis, it seems like the density kind of follows. Uh, more track more north. I was curious if that was a maybe why that is. Just kind of a curiosity question. Is that trolley lines? Is that just <coughs> circumstance policy? Um, so, in general planning theory, there's this idea that there is a privileged quarter of of cities, um, and ours has been the north side. Um, every city has one where there's always a, a area of wealth and if you know ours is Meridian Street you know historically all the mansions are there but even up in Carmel now that is still a major address for corporations headquarters and things like that to have so Meridian Street has always been our kind of alpha street when it comes to um, that um, Meridian Street did not have um, the full length of it did not have transit service on um, College Avenue did and that's college's TOD and so in two classes we'll talk about transit oriented development but College Avenue is an example of that in our, you know, right now. Every few blocks you have a commercial node, that's where the trolley stopped. That's where people got off. And that's where they got their groceries and had dinner and grabbed you know, stuff at the store to, to walk back to their homes. Um, and so College Avenue did have that. And that's why you see, if you, if you know Meridian Kessler in the, in the north side of town, um, you have the mansions kind of on Meridian Street. Um, then you have kind of the bank president's houses coming in. By the time you get to college, um, you're down to duplexes, um, some apartment buildings, um, things like that. Um, that's how we used to build neighborhoods, is you know, all those people live together, um, served by different modes of transportation. And so um, that is the north side. Um, another random tidbit from planning philosophy is the privileged quarter is almost never on 
the east side of town. You want to know why? Yes, the prevailing winds. And so that's where the pollution from the factories blew, right? And so people of money did, you know, could afford not to have to live there. And so you will find in any American city that the east side is hardly ever kind of the, the privileged quarter. And that's entirely to do to the prevailing winds. It's not, a, it's not really a decision, right? All right, Brittany? Anything final? Uh, no, I think uh, we're a little over, so I just want to um, make sure we get you guys home. Uh, but I want to give you a heads up that um, our next class will be uh, focused on walkable neighborhoods. So we're going to apply some of the knowledge that we um, we acquired in class class one and two, and start thinking about what that means uh, as far as the application of um, complete communities. So. Uh, also, make sure you uh, check your email inbox for the survey. We want to hear back from you about this class so we can make sure we're um, doing the best in the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.